Hello, and welcome to a special edition of DevOps Dialogue. My name is Paul Nashwadi, and I am joined today by Kellyanne, CEO of Datacebo. Kellyanne, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. So, data, exciting times at Datacebo. What's happening, why don't you tell us a little bit? Great, um, we were founded in 2020. We just uh, closed our seed round in last fall, uh, launched our SDV Enterprise product, which is a commercial offering of a popular open source project called Synthetic Data Vault. Um, which spun out of MIT, my lab at MIT. Um, so, you know, it's, it allows enterprises to build generative AI models on their specific data, their, their data internally in the enterprises. Uh, we focus on something that we call the third kind of data. So you have the images, you have the language. Uh, now this is the third kind, which is structured and semi-structured data, tabular data sets, that you know, pretty much every enterprise has them, and that's what their business depends on, and, and a lot of times the business secrets and the business intelligence is in that data. So we focus on that data. So SDV um, allows people to build generative models on top of that data, and use then that model to sample a lot of data. Um, that data is called synthetic data, could be used for a variety of purposes. So it's very exciting to see that this idea was several years ago, born at MIT from our own pain in getting access to data and then building this models and all that and transition that from a research project into open source, get a lot of traction, and then launch SDB Enterprise product last, last December. It's really exciting. And you know, and it's really exciting to see how it's coming together because with the explosion of data, data is the, is the lifeline of business, right? And if organizations don't have that access to information, their businesses can potentially fail. Mm -hmm. And then with the well, data, it has to be a holistic view of the entire organization. So having access to uh, all different data sets and unlocking that data set is critically important. We see this in our research. We see that access to this information is, is growing and in the importance of accessing multiple data sets is also key. When you look at Gen AI and you look at LLMs, large language models, and you look at how some of that data might be trapped in some of these enterprises, what does that mean to Data Siva? Um, so for LLMs, I think the interesting thing is that LLMs were able to build models because language data is so publicly and widely available. So it's not like, uh, for this kind of data, it's not like all insurance companies are going to get together and say release all the data, right? So it, it's, it's not going to happen. Um, so as a result, like the data, to build generative AI models for this kind of data, it has to be built foundationally within an enterprise premises. So that's just a very different style of functioning. What that also means is that you have to like, bring algorithms to the data, and you also have to make algorithms work in a way that they don't need a lot of compute. So we designed several model, modeling techniques and algorithms at MIT that are very, you know, very well known and from, from long time, they're called probabilistic graphical models. Um, we use them to build these uh, models and allow enterprises to build within their prem, within their walls, uh, models specific to their data. And that's really, really important for them because as, as I said, language, you have tons of data available uh, on internet. Though, again, once you have a model, you fine tune it with your enterprise data. But this kind of data, you, you have to allow generative AI models to be built internally in, within the enterprise. Yeah, it, may, it makes sense to use those models, um, but when you build out that methodology, there is research that goes behind that methodology. So I'd like to hear a little bit about what, the, you, know, what you learned out of MIT Labs and how that kind of was put into the commercialization of, of Data SIBO and how that works together and, and what does that look like? Yeah, that, that's really good. I think um, at, at MIT also this project went through certain phases so all the way going back to 2014. I think our first challenge was, uh, we built it for ourselves uh, because we had the data from an educational platform. We, MIT launched edX, uh, an educational platform, and they were collecting a lot of data, which was sensitive data, and we wanted to have access controls on it. So in my lab, we used to have one computer at that time, and we used to shuffle students around that computer. Uh, <laughs> to, so it was like a lot of productivity loss, and then we decided, well, why don't we create a generative model of the data Generative models are known to allow you to sample data from it. So we, we built something called a synthetic student, uh, which will allow us to create synthetic data that's realistic and use that. Once that project was successful, we thought, how generalizable is this? Can this generalize to all the databases and perhaps solve all our access issues when we try to work with our clients at MIT? So then we built synthetic data vault. Uh, 
I think transitioning it to open source was a very good idea because it actually allowed us to give it to a lot of people so they can try it on their enterprise data sets. So that, was, that went very well. We had one million plus downloads and people, did, uh, people used the software. And then we, we started looking at like working with enterprises very, very closely and started looking at how even more complex their data sets are than what we have ever seen in the, in the public domain. So as a result, I think that helped us put some features in the SDB enterprise and that actually started taking off. It sounds like the synthetic data approach really helped with uh, basically productivity gains. Um, so what other use cases like it, not just from the lab's perspective, but from enterprises, you can, get, can you expand a little bit more on that? Yeah, yeah. One of the use cases that, that we see is very powerful is testing software applications. Uh, you know, as, as you can imagine, last, in last decade, almost all software applications have become data driven, which means a lot of logic is depending upon, dependent upon the data they see. So they look at the data and say, okay, if this happens, take this path, or if this happens, take this path. And there's even subpaths in there too. So to test these applications, when you try to make new releases, um, developers end up spending some time creating the test data. Uh, sometimes for performance, sometimes for functionality testing, sometimes for um, you know, API testing, when two APIs are talking to each other. And that usually takes a few days at, before every release, then it, worth of time to create that data. Either they write manually or they request for access for production data. So there's a number of ways they try to get that. Um, and we realized that in talking to our beta customers that that's where a lot of time is like, uh, based, like not wasted but spent, uh, manual time is spent. And developers actually don't like it. It's they, one of the developers said it's the most boring part of my work. I would like to write more features, ship more features and build more functionality. So that's where what they do is they use SDB Enterprise, build a generative model, and then sample from it to get the data to test their applications. Yeah, I haven't met a developer yet that said, I really want to be in maintenance mode. They, they, they really want to innovate, right? They want to drive that innovation and, uh, and, they, and be excited about what they're doing. Uh, the interesting thing about data, though, in with modernizing applications, you know, you have these, historically you have heritage applications that may be monolithic and they have uh, single data sources, but really as we start growing into these modernized approaches, it's more distributed and scalable. I, I'm interested to hear how DataCivo kind of connects these modernized applications into a scalable solution. So I, I think a lot of them, um, their, their application teams, they have data sources, um, the centralized data source where there, I, I don't know if that's what you're referring to, there's a centralized data lake and data sources where the data resides. The decentralized approach is more, more uh, scalable in, in my opinion. So where a team that is maintaining an application looks at their data that it, this application consumes and they build a generative model or an SDV model specific for that application. And then it becomes part of their pipeline, their regular testing and CI CD pipeline. And once, a, once one team does that, then adjacent teams will also want to do that. And, and so it's a much more uh, bottom up in a way, bottom up in the sense that application centric uh, view of saying that let's do it for one application and then another and another and another, rather than going from the data warehouse point of view, which is very gigantic and messy. Um, and you may, there's not much of a governance or it takes a lot of time to, uh, even if you create a model, you have to govern and all that. So the lot of, um, thing that we are seeing adoption, we are seeing in a much more decentralized way uh, and growing in that fashion. Does that cause uh, challenges with the organizations with it, but because it is decentralized from the data sources? That's a, that's a good question. I, it doesn't actually, and, and so the reason being that um, when you try to build a very localized model, because our modeling is so fast and sampling is so fast, uh, they actually don't store the samples. They don't need to store the samples. So it becomes like a very uh, part of their workflow and their pipeline. So it doesn't create issues with, like it's not competing with the data warehouse or data lakes or anything. It's, it seems like a completely different workflow. It's, it's part of the software design and development workflow. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and, and having the workflow at the location, you hear a lot, um, especially with the large workloads, work use cases that are out there, you hear a lot about processing data in place because moving those large data sets around is just too, it's too large, you can't do it. It's too much data. 
So you need to process it, get the results, and then shoot the results back to a, a centralized location. That's what we're seeing in our research as well. We see application portability is key, but that it's really about processing the information in place. Yeah. That's actually data portability is another big, big case for uh, this kind of modeling where you don't want to move the data around if you're moving application and testing application in different environments, uh, if you're migrating to cloud or if you're testing in different environments. So what you would do is you would build the model. The model is, uh, it's fascinating. I mean, that's what most is fascinating about this whole generative modeling for this kind of data is modeling is just, the model is just one file. It's just one file. It's a very, in a way, it's a very compressed form of the, of the database. So you can move the model around and you can sample from it. And by definition, the model only captures the aggregate statistics and aggregate properties. So it's not actually, it doesn't have any real data in it. So the file you can move around and then you can put it next to your application and you can sample. So now you're suddenly not moving the data around in between different environments. We see a lot of customers like passionate about that aspect because A, you don't want to move data around a lot. B, um, it's expensive. Once you're migrated the data to the cloud, moving things around is, is uh, I take it, is actually expensive. So they would like to prefer to build a model, use that model in different environments, sample from it data on demand. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I, I think I like. I mean, I like the approach that you're talking about, where you you move the simple set of information, take this, take the information you need, and then produce the results. It's really what I'm hearing from clients, from customers that are asking about these business challenges. Um, the other thing I hear a lot is about you know we talk about data. It's always a big question about availability. You know, when you have availability in the, in your data, and when you build these these models that you're talking about. How do you how you do you ensure that that data is actually being put in place and being used appropriately? So we have a lot of guardrails to um, so the data availability problem. I, I, I'll, I'll I'll say briefly some few things about it. They come from a couple of issues. One is that some events or some things that you're reporting are so rare in happen in in terms of happening, they don't have that much data about those events or rare occurrences. So that's one availability problem. The second availability problem is that you had a product, let's say, in UK, and you're just launched in US. Um, so now you're slowly getting the customers for this, or you know, you don't have as much data as you used to have in OK, UK. So as a result, you have a data availability problem. So the generative model and then generating synthetic data can help you with that data availability problem in both cases. But one thing we do is we provide guardrails, which is when we do synthesize the data, we can tell the quality of this data and how confident are we that this is the data because if some of this data is in the neighborhood of data points where you have very sparse availability. So how real are these data sets if you can't even know what the reality looks like in that space? So we have a lot of quality metrics to, to assess and say, okay, this is the quality of this data, this is how much you should trust. Um, and one other interesting thing that came about from, from some one of our customers was because it is, it is going to happen. A lot of um, data supply is going to be synthetic data, right? So one of the question is like, Kayan, if that's going to happen everywhere, uh, how do I know that I'm using synthetic or real? Because you're claiming that synthetic looks as good as real. So that brought back an idea of trying to put some markers. So maybe in the keys, we try to put SDV, or maybe in the primary keys, or some, somewhere we put markers. Uh, encoded markers, so it actually is clearly uh, can be seen that it's actually synthetic data. Not you're working with synthetic data, you're not working with real data. So that's the first thing that we want to we want we want to put as a guardrail, so people know that they're aware they're working with synthetic data. The second thing is obviously all these quality metrics that we can provide. Uh, also, we can tell them how how much trustworthy or confidence you should have in this synthetic data based on the quality that is generated. Very good. Well. You know, we, we're coming to the end of our session here, um, and we talked a lot about data and the application modernization process and the impacts of the CI/CD pipeline and what it means to move ahead and such. What would you recommend to the audience on how they could get started with data CBA? Um, I, I would say start with the Synthetic Data Vault publicly available source. Um, go there. That's the first stop in our in our product adoption. Um, build an SDV model, synthesize data, test out ROI. Uh, I think we find teams who, who try to assess the ROI upfront 
are more likely to succeed in a broader adoption uh, when they try to test the ROI and assess the ROI with the publicly available source. And then after that, once they hit complexity of you know, either multiple teams or multiple applications, they reach out to us. Uh, we have SDV Enterprise that can handle complex data sets, uh, complex data structures and data formats and the whole uh, the holy grail of enterprise data, um, and then that's where they can start from application and application, and they can go in that fashion. Very good, very good. Kalyan, I'd like to thank you for your time, your perspective and insights today, and I'd like to thank the audience for attending today's session. For more information, please go to futurimgroup.com.